morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Today's live streams discussion focuses on COVID-19 mutations and public health strategies. Joining us today are two research scientists from Cedar sinai Medical Center. Dr. Jasmine Plummer is Associate Director of the Cedar sinai Center for Bioinformatics and Functional Genomics. Dr. Eric Vale is the Director of the Molecular Pathology Laboratory at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Dr. Vale and Dr. Plummer were co-corresponding authors of the research on the coronavirus mutant discovered at Cedar sinai We are also delighted to welcome back our moderator, local journalist and Los Angeles Magazine contributor, John Rigarde. For those of you who are new to our programs, we will be taking questions in about 30 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, and she'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Hi, John. It's great to have you back as a moderator. We've got a great audience for you, and I'm sure they have, we'll have so many questions. Absolutely, Kim. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, and a big thank you to everyone at the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall for having us here today. Have a terrific program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yes, we really are fortunate for all the great work that the World Affairs Council and Town Hall has done. You've kept us consistently up to date and informed on so many important issues. And speaking of that, it's hard to think of an issue that's more important than what we are discussing today. The coronavirus, of course, has been an inescapable part of our lives for nearly a year. And while we are all eager for vaccinations and look to the light at the end of the tunnel, we're clearly still in a very long, dark tunnel. According to the LA County Department of Public Health statistics from yesterday afternoon, there have been more than 1.1 million COVID-19 cases identified in Los Angeles and 18,360 people have died. There have been 44,000 deaths in California, 465,000 in the United States with half of those since November 1st, according to the New York Times. And now some of the concern is turning to variants. What we really need as we go forward is the facts, the science. And we're fortunate today that we have people who can give us those facts, deliver us that science. So I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Jasmine Plummer, who as Kim just told us is a research scientist at Cedar sinai Medical Center, and Dr. Eric Vale, the Director of Molecular Pathology at Cedars. They've played a leading role in identifying a California variant of the virus known as Cal20C, and have been widely quoted, including in stories in the New York Times and Los Angeles Times. So thank you both for joining us. We got some questions and look forward to getting into this. Um, what I want to do is just start with really the basics here. Can you, in the simplest terms, explain what a variant is, how it arises, and then walk us through how you identified Cal20C? Were you looking for something and just came across it? We'll start with you on this one, Dr. Plummer. Um, thank you for having us. And so. Let's start really simple so we can make sure the entire audience is on the same page. A variant is simply speaking a change or alteration in DNA or RNA. And so that isn't unique to, um, and make sure everybody's on the same page with the language. So SARS-CoV-2 is the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, which is the disease. And so like all viruses, or ourselves included, it happens over time that we get variation. So, you know, cells don't replicate as well, and it's just a natural process um, in viruses, influenza is the same way. And so over time, as the virus moves from person to person, it can acquire these changes in the DNA or RNA structure, in this case, RNA. And all that means is like you swap out, uh, for people that remember their first year biology, you essentially swap out these four letters a c t or g that's as simple as it is so an a can go in the place of a c and we don't always know where those variations or variants what is functional meaning you can 
Um, all viruses will evolve. We expected that. And we'll talk about that later in terms of how and why we use the vaccines that we use. Um, because we expected viruses to have variation or variants over time. And so we really embarked on this early on. Um, we had had a study in April and May. It was one of the large, um, and I think maybe one of the only studies from Los Angeles, where we actually looked at transmission. So the nice thing about looking at variants or how SARS-CoV-2 has evolved, as it moves from person to person, it'll acquire these variants. And we, you know, first could identify that from transmission, meaning looking at kind of how the Cedars population looked compared to the rest of the world at the time. Then when we had a really big surge um, during the holidays, there was, you know, the UK had, uh, had stopped its borders. And we here at Cedars, along with the rest of the LA healthcare community, were really inundated. You know, we had had over a million cases at that point um, in Los Angeles. And so really looking at whether our frontline workers were being overwhelmed by a UK variant, and that was something else we had to worry about. And when that happened, we looked in our internal kind of about 200 patients, um, including outpatients, emergency room. I mean, it's, it's a variety of whether that's public patients or um, people within the hospital itself. Um, and we saw this new Cal20C. So it means we saw a different type of variant that existed in the Cedars population. I think it's important that we were looking for the UK strain, right? When we when we when we did this, that that was the whole point of the initial study, uh, and it really proves the old axiom that if you don't look for it, you'll you'll never find it. Um, and the, the there's a reason why the UK sort of variant UK strain was the first one that was really widely publicized. And it was because the UK has a fantastic public health system that is doing enormous amounts of sequence. There's over four, almost 500,000 sequences publicly available of SARS, of the virus, the coronavirus uh, on, 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 on the internet. And half of them come from the UK. So they have sequenced about 6% of their uh, total cases approximately and the US is probably in the 0.1 or even less percent range. And so the, if you don't look for it, you'll never find it. And that's sort of what happened here. Great, doctors and both of you, thank you for starting it with so basic to make sure we all are on the same page because this really helps as we build up. So going from that, what went through your minds as you began to realize, and we'll talk about pervasiveness in a moment, but as you just began to realize what you had identified and what this could mean within the community. Again, we'll start with Dr. Plummer on this one and then Dr. Vale, please feel free to jump in. So, I mean, it's exactly what Dr. Vale had just said. We were looking for the UK variant and there was this moment that we have, obviously with all, and we're, we're talking coincidentally to the holiday surge, right? It wasn't shocking when we have a million cases and we've become an epicenter ourselves in LA that we had our own thing. Um, and so that was when we started to look deeper into the numbers, and we'll talk about that later. But essentially within the Cedars community, it wasn't like we were looking for Cal20C. We saw almost 40% within those 200. And then, then you start to look at community impact and looking at that, that very database that um, Dr. Vale just talked about, where we have, you know, we have sprinklings of um, data from Los Angeles Public Health Department deposited and other people throughout the state. Um, but it is sprinklings. But when we look there, we can see that it is kind of this, co it could be coincidental, but we have this emergence now of this Cal20C strain. And so that can't be separated right now from what's going on in our community. Um, meaning we know that we have more cases, we have more cases. So it's not shocking that we're spreading our own thing around because, you know, by virtue of having a variant that exists in LA in a higher proportion, we also have more cases. So we're just able to kind of see that in terms of our strain is going, is going up within the community. Right. And so, so I think that the, if, if it was just staying at 5, 10, 15% and hovering along, I, I think it would have been interesting, but it wouldn't have been newsworthy, uh, so to say. It was the fact that it, 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 just, it, it just exponentially increased over, over a couple months. So it went from, you know, four total cases out of 1,000 in, in, in October 
to to 20 percent ish in november and then in all of southern california by january it was like almost 45 percent so it, it 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 it's it, it's definitely more fit for the environment that it's in, that it's that it that it that it's increasing at 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 the rate that it is. But there's still a ton of functional studies that we have to do to see exactly why and exactly how much more fit it is. And was it a surprise that it went from essentially non-existent almost in October to spreading so far so quickly? Yeah. So so I this might be apocryphal, but I I, I always quote Einstein on this. It's the greatest. Uh, the greatest noise in, meta, in, uh, in in research is not eureka, but hmm, that's interesting. Because you look at the data and you go like, wow, what, what is that? And 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 you see it, and it and it, it just it, it gives you this crazy. It, it's amazing. It's a, it's a, it's when you find something you're not expecting, and it's something that's important. That's I think where where the best the best science gets made. And I and I think just to elaborate on that, also based on when this was happening, it was over the holidays. We were rushing. We had people come back from the holidays to try and make sure, like the front, you know, because it was in the media of this UK strain. We didn't want to inundate our frontline workers with some other thing. And so, but it wasn't shock. There is a little bit of shock. So I guess that's what Dr. Vale's saying. It wasn't super surprising. It was this big chunk. So imagine in the Cedars population, it's almost 40% of what we sequenced. So that is kind of like, of course, given the widespread um, numbers that were happening in LA at the time. So it's not Cal20C itself. It's the opportunity that arose during the holidays for us to really start that that upward climb that Dr. Vale had just spoke about. And, and Dr. Plummer kind of glossed over it, but we really got to give a shout out to the people in the laboratory that actually did all of, we we analyzed the data, we helped analyze the data, right, the paper, but there, there were techs in the lab that pulled samples and uh, did the actual sequencing and loaded the machine at 11 p.m. New Year's Eve for this study. So the it, it, it was, the, without them, there's no way that any of this could have, could have, could have and I, and I think that speaks to kind of the community. So we talk about community impact. It was important for us also within theaters to really make sure that one, we are protecting our frontline workers, but that the collective community, I mean, Dr. Vale and I, this is not our full-time job. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it really speaks to really the research scientists that are coming online to help with the effort. and. The broader community like yourself trying to understand the science because it is one thing for other diseases that we do look at in our normal lives and another thing for everybody to just come on board and, and try their best to help out um and i think that our community is just getting kind of the the rewards of, of that effort great and we've referenced already a couple of times the you know the, the december surge and clearly what we've seen in Los Angeles County and throughout California, you know, has been heartbreaking. Um, you know, Mayor Garcetti has sought to stress that what we endured came amid a very strong push for responsible behavior. There were continued exhortations for or masking, for social distancing, and we know that people got together, but we also know as well that many people were following the rules. In fact, Mayor Garcetti at one of his briefings said, we did everything right, and yet this deadly surge came. What, so what role do you think it was that Cal20C played in contributing to this level of pain that we endured? I don't want to, I am not going to disagree directly with, with Mayor Garcetti, but um, if everyone s stayed in their house and never left their room and didn't move, then there would be no coronavirus. Obviously, that's not uh feasible in any way whatsoever and we have to figure out a happy balance between the two but in october uh the positivity rate was like two percent three percent the the amount of cases was very low as we started to get into the holiday season and it's no coincidence that this arose during the holiday season people were kind of lulled into this sense of security because of what had come before and they wanted to see family it, it's hard to be away from people for eight, nine months. We've all lived through it, I know, but it, it bears bears repeating that that this is something that was very difficult. Um, uh, and multi generational, unmasked, thirty people dinners are pretty much 
the bread and butter of coronavirus. Like that, that's how this spreads. That's how this uh, uh, get, goes around, and that's how it kind of explodes. And so I, 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 I'm not saying that as a community we didn't try our best to do everything that right, but it, you know, socially distancing, masking, washing your hands, getting a vaccine when you get it. That, that's how that's how you get out of this, right? That, that's how you. That's how we. That's how we prevent it. And this variant probably contributed to the magnitude of the surge. So how high that peak got, but it didn't cause the peak to begin with. And I think that that's something that really needs to be uh, clarified. And 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 it human behavior is 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 everything with this with 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 with, with this strain. There was some there's something in the LAX still has a million people a, a month or something going 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 through it. So obviously. There's a lot of people still traveling and a lot of people still still doing things that are maybe not up to what the uh, public health authorities have have asked of people. And and I'm I'm just going to clarify that a little bit in terms of we allowed right so we kind of allowed something. It's Cal 20 C in our case, but we allowed the opportunity for a Cal 20 C to emerge. So let's go back to the numbers, John. Is that is that if you had one out of 1,230 in July, then you, I think Dr. Bale gave a number of four out of a few thousand in October. We weren't even in a percentage. And then it could be sheerly coincidence, but over the holidays, as the numbers ticked up, the numbers of the prevalence of this strain also went up. And so I think just in a full round version of when Mayor Garcetti says we did all the right things, I think we have to empower ourselves a little bit more and say, we have the ability to curb this virus if we do what Dr. Bale said in all four things, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there is the sick and, and you know, there is a security in wearing a mask, but what Cal 20C tells us is we didn't socially distance, right? We may have wore a mask at a Thanksgiving dinner of 30 people, but if it was over eight hours and the masks come off when you eat and, you know, so being able to control all four variables, and the, I think we're going to talk about this a little later, but the other fourth variable of staying home. So not only wearing a mask, washing your hands, socially distancing, but staying home. So when Dr. Vail says about traveling, I mean, we're essential workers and we're in COVID but I haven't been on a vacation since 2019. I mean, you know, there is this, does everybody need to really go to Utah to go skiing right now? Is that essential travel? And are we doing our best part of all four measures together, right? And I think that together really speaks to the holiday gatherings and why this, this, this percentage is, this, it didn't just tick up. It didn't go from, you know, it went from four out of thousands, right? Not even a percentage to over um, 20% now in the state. 40, 45%. 40% yeah. now. Yeah, and, and don't get us wrong. We get it. Like, I, 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 everybody wants to leave their house. Like, I, I, everyone understands. It's, it's just, it, it's, it's one of those things that this is one of those amazing challenges that you have to do it together. Otherwise, if you don't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't go well. But so, so. It, it speaks to us empowering ourselves, right? We know the tools. If we as a community really could feel like, I really know how to get this under control. And if in any way, show or form, I can follow these four things as effectively, like as much as I possibly can, then we do ourselves as a community have the power to curb this. And I think that's pretty, I mean, when we don't have a power of like who's getting a vaccine right now or those things, I think if Los Angeles community could really feel like they empower themselves by doing these four things, then we have a chance and we can do it. And I think you really break it down into essentially eight words. We have the ability to curb this virus, um, <clears throat> which is very well put and that should probably be on billboards and yeah. um, messages. Um, you know, are there indications that, you know, like we've read about with the British variant that how 20C is more contagious than the original strain? And is there information that you've seen on whether it may be more deadly or causes more serious illness? What, what have you been seeing on these matters? 
so uh, let me let, I'll go from the, the the second one first and then go to the go to go to the go to the go to the more contagious. So um, uh, for virulence or more severe disease or anything like that, there's no evidence at this time uh, that that it does cause it. Unfortunately, the public databases that we queried to really add numbers to our study uh, don't have clinical information attached to it. We do have those 192 cases that we looked at at Cedars that had clinical information, but it's underpowered. So it's very hard to draw statistical evidence. It looks like right now that there's no difference, but I, I, I can't say it with a, uh, with, with a completely firm uh, scientific backing behind it. Um, if you asked me my guess, I would say that it's probably not going to have uh, uh, an impact on severity of disease. But I have to admit, if you had asked me two weeks ago about the UK variant and whether or not it was going to have an impact on severity of disease, there was a lot of confounding stuff on that, and everyone was saying that mm, maybe not, but it looks like that that does have some impact. So we have to do all the studies, we have to do all the uh, uh, the research into this to be able to really give a firm answer. As for contagiousness, there is just evidence alone on the number of cases, the rate of rise, and the percentage over time for these for for this for this strain in 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 our population that is suggesting that the virus is more fit um, that likely has to do with a little bit more contagiousness or possibly immune evasion or something like that there could be confounding things that we have to look at right now but it, at this time it's most likely that this uh, that this strain is probably more 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 contagious to some degree. Um, we we again this is all the there's teams at UCSF that are looking at this. We're looking at this. There's uh, a bunch of bunch of work getting, going on right now to to kind of prove whether or not uh, the the this strain either has more immune evasion or is more infectious because it can bind differently to the to the, the to the the cells in the in, in the body, um, but at, at this time, just the numbers themselves speak to it's it, it's more fit in this population at this time. So, and, and just to elaborate a little bit, is one we're at Cedars in a very unique population uh, pop, place to look at this, meaning we do have patient data, so we're just boosting the numbers to support kind of what Dr. Vale's saying. We need numbers to really show you know, severity of disease, did you get hospitalized more? But we're in a unique situation to do that. Unlike um, just looking at Dodger Stadium samples that don't get a lot of follow-up, we have that in our patient population. But the other thing that I wanted to stress, because I think that this comes out a lot in the media is infectious, more infectious, more contagious. We have to also, A, we need, absolutely we need more studies. But two, have a broader view of how these the evolution of viruses happen. It is not unpredicted from everything that we know of influenza, other SARS viruses that have happened, is all viruses evolve, right? We spoke about that in the beginning and just turning back to it right now. Is it is this, it's not a great place for any virus or any infection to kill the host, meaning, you know. Most flu seasons start really rampant, you know, you get flus and most people that get in the beginning, it's very severe and you're like knocked out for a few days. As the flu season continues on, you know, more people get it. That's not to say that the, these new strains, there won't be one that is more severe or one that will, you know, we'll talk about later, evade vaccine, but it's not unusual or as the viruses kind of transmit through people, SARS-CoV-2 is trying to stay alive, right? And in order to do so, it's becoming more infectious, but that could be a great sign for us because again, we can empower ourselves and curb it, right? It, the, it could on the other side, if it's not more severe, be a good sign, meaning, you know, it's more infectious, we can curb that. But if it isn't more severe, then that means, you know, hopefully less people end up in the hospital and those things. So it's not, Let's not totally be alarmist and kind of give an idea that contagious or more infectious does not necessarily mean a super bad thing if we're able to curb it. Great. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Plummer. And, you know, we've referenced already a couple of times, um, you know, some of these you know, other variants. Of course, we've seen, you know, the British ones, uh, South Africa, Brazil. Um, I realize that this question could get almost technical, but, you know, in layman's terms, what is it that makes the California variant, Cow20C, unique? 
it's got different mutations. It's, so the the genetic structure of 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 the of the virus, the viral RNA, the genome has uh, a distinct set of mutations that are not seen uh, in 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 these different strains. Um, the many of the strains that we've been talking about in the news, like the UK strain, the uh, uh, South Africa, Brazil, uh, those those have they share some commonality in their uh, mutations, but they were independently uh, acquired. So it's not like UK strain turned into South Africa strain turned into Brazil strain. It's they all kind of uh, had sort of a convergent uh, evolution with with a, a particular variant called 501Y. Um, uh, there's also some thoughts on the 484K uh, variant. Um, the really definitional variant in our strain, along with four other ones, is this uh, 452R in the spike protein. So I know they got a little technical there, but essentially what, what, what researchers are really looking at are uh, these mutations in the spike protein of the virus. And spike protein is, corona is a crown, and it's because when you look at it under a microscope, you see a little crown of spike proteins around it. Uh, and so the spike protein is what's used to bind to the host, is to bind to the human cells. Um, and it's the big one in the news is the ACE2 receptor. There may be other receptors in different tissues that it can bind to, but uh, this mutation, this, this, this variant, uh, 452R in our Cal.20C is uh, in the receptor binding domain of the uh, spike protein. And that's why it's of particular interest. Right. Okay. So in this case, uh, a little bit of California innovation that we probably yeah. did not want. Um, so let's go to the question that I'm sure you are both asked uh, maybe 600, 700 times a day. Um, the question of whether the vaccines currently going into arms will be <clears throat> effective against these new variants. From your research and what you're seeing within the medical community, what are your thoughts on this recognizing things change very quickly? Uh, but regarding variants and vaccines, whether it's Cal20C or other mutations. So I think we, I, we've both been vaccinated. So our first message to everybody is when you are able, please go and um, get vaccinated. We have, um, and th that one, it speaks to vaccine rollout, right? So if we do know, if there is going to be a variant or strain, that evades the vaccine, our best bet is to roll out and get as many people vaccinated as possible as strains emerge or variants emerge. So let's let's get that out there. We don't know enough about Cal20C right now um, to say whether or not it's going to evade, but to speak a little bit about the um, vaccines that currently are available. So mRNA vaccines, which are the Pfizer and Moderna ones, we're really rolled out with this in mind, right? The idea that viruses evolve are, is not new. And so, you know, the mRNA vaccines are targeted for the idea that that spike protein may have mutated over time and they're really addressing that. The other ones, and we've seen some um, suggestions that the South African strain is kind of evading some of the um, monoclonal antibody vaccines. And so the difference between the mRNA vaccines and the monoclonal is is that it could evade a portion of the monoclonal because the monoclonal is like a very set state of that spike protein. Um, but they're devising, even with the monoclonals, they anticipated that and made cocktails. So that, you know, hopefully with the cocktails that you um, have kind of some protectiveness. Sure, but so it's say, just, to, just to clarify that a little bit, the, the monoclonals are the like, you know, you heard about Eli Lilly and Regeneron, what they gave to to President Trump when he had when he had coronavirus. Um, those are those are those are antibodies that are like preformed and made, and they just give them to you. Um, the the vaccines uh, elicit a polyclonal response, but the mRNA vaccines are especially good because the way that they work is that essentially your body produces the spike protein inside of immune cells those immune cells break the protein up into hundreds of little bits and then put it out and so that the, uh, the, the body can recognize it, creating this enormous response, both in the humoral immune system, which is your antibodies, right? 
And in the cellular immune system, which is like your T cells and everything like that, they create uh, an intracellular response as well. And so we don't even test the cellular side of the immune system. So everybody talks about, oh, antibodies are six times less or, oh, antibodies are this or that. First of all, the antibodies that are elicited are like thousands of times higher than what are required for neutralization. So if you have six times less, it doesn't matter. Um, and then on top of that, nobody even looks at the, uh, the, 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 the cellular side of the immune system. The, I think it was the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, did show data of some reduced efficacy in the South Africa variant where they went from around 70 something percent to around 50 something percent. In the beginning days of the pandemic, the FDA said, we will approve a vaccine that is 50 percent effective. So if the worst that there is right now is that it's dropping a, vac uh, a vaccine down to 50% that was already not even as high as the mRNA vaccines, it's the worst. I, I think that it, it goes right back to Dr. Plummer's point that if we get enough people vaccinated and we get enough people uh, through, through this, that we will eventually get to a point where we are stopping all of the transmission regardless of the variant and we don't allow even more variants to, to, to evolve. And the last thing of that is, I love the perspective Dr. Vale just gave. We are talking antibody response versus natural immunity. That's totally right. So if you were to get COVID and your natural immune system, a vaccine is still way more effective. I mean, you know, when we talk about decreased vaccination efficacy, it actually is still way better than if you got COVID, right? So you know, we have to think about proportions, right? These are like not a 10% not a difference. These are like thousand fold, tenfold changes in your system of having a prepared antibody response, right? When you get, when you get SARS-CoV-2, you have to generate your antibodies to get it up and running and fighting instead of already having an army there ready with a higher efficiency. Th yeah. Those are two very separate things right. and yeah. I, I will say that this this mRNA vaccine is going to win a Nobel Prize. That yeah, some, somebody, is. somebody's going to win it for the, it, it. These are amazing, and I think that we're it's 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 something. And even if even if something out of left field gut comes out that completely kills it, kills the vaccine, Moderna or Pfizer can make a new a new booster shot in six weeks. So right. like 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 that that's that's the time frame we're looking at here. It's 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 amazingly quick how quickly they can they can turn around. Uh, booster shots for these vaccines, even in the case of an unlikely case of vaccine. Totally that is uh, something I think all of us want to hear. I want to ask one more real quick question, and then I want to turn it over to Jessica, because I know our viewers are going to have some um, you know, important questions at all. But, you know, again, the refrain that we keep hearing is that even with the vaccines roll out, this is no time to relax, that the next two months are very difficult, very important, um, you know, advice that we might want to double mask even for the near future. What sort of just quick gener general advice do you have for people worried about what they need to do in these coming months until we get to the point that we've been talking about with the vaccines? So I think... Everything so you uh, sorry, you go. Go, go, go ahead. Go. You go. Everything you were told to do before, if you're doing it, please continue to do it. Um, there's some new evidence from the CDC today that uh, a double mask, especially a cloth mask over a, uh, uh, a, a surgical mask with both people wearing it reduces spread of coronavirus by like 99.7% or some, some absurdly high number. Um, and then... Uh, even if a, a, just a really nice form-fitting surgical mask, so that if you loop it around your ears or twist it so that it t goes tight to your, tight, uh, I covered my mouth, it goes tight to your face uh, or something like that. So yeah, mm -hmm. so to make it kind of form-fitting. Um, uh, but if you're already masking, if you're already socially distancing, if you're already washing your hands, if you're already doing all of these things, please continue to do it. If you are not, please we're really close like that that's all there this is not march of last year where like it, it there was no light at that end of that tunnel this this we are we are almost there we can make do it together and we just have to kind of buckle down and get it done and i think really to stress is all four things together that it's not you know circle back to the idea of cal 20c and why we found it all four things. I think we're so tired. We think, okay, everybody has a mask somewhere in their car and they're putting it on. 
but really thinking about the social distancing when you can, right? Like, I know everybody's exhausted and they want to see their friends and family, but if we really want to see them long term, like really just break the barrier and, and get through this pandemic, it has to be that in combination with the mask, hand washing, and staying home where possible, right? We know that th these variants move. The movement is by humans, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> This is no. not going to like deer that are then going across the border. No, no, it's, it's only people that are, that are spreading spreading this around. And we can track that. The genome sequencing is allowing us to track them. So when you have said, I didn't go anywhere, we know that this Cal20C strain is moving. And I hope that there aren't that many essential employees that have to travel so, you know, so everywhere all at once that it sh we should be able to contain this. It's up to us and we can do it. We really can do it. Great, thank, thank you for that. And now let me uh, kick it over to uh, Jessica who's gonna have some questions uh, from our audience. Great, thank you so much. We have a ton of questions coming in so I'll try to get to as many as we can. The first one, is mRNA technology likely to be applied to other diseases from flu to cancer in the coming years and decades? Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, uh, the, um, uh, the they're they're actually you know it's funny this was not an mrna vaccine this was a, a, a different vaccine but uh there was actually a universal flu vaccine concept that came out a few months ago that got completely ignored because you know COVID's going on and everybody's worried about that but progress will be made in uh all of these different fields and these this mrna vaccine it's it, they're amazing they're absolutely amazing if you have a nice antigenic protein like the spike protein to, to stick into somebody's immune system. This will be copied over and over and over again uh, with, with, with different, different, different diseases. And, and I think on that point, when people are hesitant about vaccines is, you know, it's still with all the variants, it's still more ef effective than the flu shot, right? So in general, we, we're doing much better even with all the variants. So that's something to keep in mind too, which we um, have had lots of experience with. Thank you. With the slow rollout of the vaccine and the variants, is this disease likely to become endemic with us needing an annual shot to manage variants like the flu shot? I don't think so, uh, but there are some very smart people that say that it's a possibility. And so I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say no. Uh, I think, I think that we will get over this, but, uh, but, I but. I say cart before horse, like let's get over there. <laughs> let's, let's get let's there all first. Let's get back <laughs> and see where we end up. Um, the good news is if we have to, it's really, you know, we got through the hurdle of getting it up and running by FDA. And so that next hurdle of getting vaccinated, I think is, you know, we rolled out a flu shot. We're we'll able to roll this out if we had to. Yeah. Okay. What is your position about opening schools? Is this strain affecting children? So two questions there. That is outside of our purview uh, on, 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 on this, that, that it's a very fraught topic. And again, there are very impassioned and reasonable arguments on, on, every, on both sides of those debates that we, we really aren't experts in, 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 in that sort of public policy. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, this person says, I've been vaccinated over 65. What can I do now that I couldn't do before I was vaccinated? You can know that you were vaccinated. Like, the, 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 uh, the, you know, there's a big difference in the European messaging and the American messaging for, for, for what you can do afterwards. Uh, right now, the public health experts in America are saying, you still need to socially distance, you still need to mask, you still need to, the, 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 the vaccine is one part of getting through this uh, and, and, uh, and uh, present, preventing the spread of the virus. But remember, there is still some preliminary data that vaccine recipients can still be asymptomatic carriers. Less likely, but it's a possibility. And so I, I, I just, I would caution against thinking that this just means certain, you can go, go, do, go back to what we were doing two years ago until everything is opened up and everyone has had the chance to get a vaccine. So I would say thank you for getting vaccinated and thank you for being part of, you know, helping to curb this. And I agree with um, Dr. Vale is, you know, we, it's still that you have to, you remember he was talking about the machinery where you present 
um, the epitope or the, the protein itself. So we don't, you know, there, there's data and preliminary data, but, you know, we don't know once you've gone it that you can't keep giving it on or getting that machine up and running before you've transmitted it. So I think keep doing your part. Thank you for getting vaccinated. That's the fifth part. And then keep doing the other four. Thank you. All right. Do more racially or ethnically diverse populations create more diverse viruses because of variations in genetic makeup and immune systems? A good question. Um, uh, the, I, uh, we don't know. We don't, know. Uh, there, we don't. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for that. But it's a great hypothesis, and that's definitely something that someone should 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 take a, take a look into because of the different ways that the immune system presents uh, epitope the parts of the protein. And there is a large consortium now um, that we are not part of that is looking at host factor that would get to you that part. So um, it's essentially like a GWAS, if anyone's familiar with the term, which looks at like just people that have had it and people that haven't across ethnicities and across um, and looking at those variables. But that's out of our domain of research. But it is going on in the US and globally. Did SARS-CoV-1 in the early 2000s inform treatment methods for COVID-19 and were vaccines effective then, or did it eventually weaken enough that we could live with it in the population? So um, there was a learning process to the mRNA vaccine being developed, which is from MERS. So somebody had figured out the protein structure. So remember that crown with the spike on it um, had figured out the 3D structure of that. So they knew kind of how to target it. Um, so that was the learning curve from the vaccination standpoint. And MERS was the one in between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So that's Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. It's also a head of coronavirus. Continue, sorry, I just wanted to. Oh, no. That's okay. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 remember, SARS-CoV-1 didn't really spread. Um, it was, the, the thing that makes this COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, that makes this, this, this such a, a tricky bug is that, it, it it causes like a delayed uh, it, a window of, uh, of presentation of symptoms where you can still be infected. So SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, the people that were getting sick got sick quickly, noticeably, and they got sicker generally than people that get SARS-CoV-2. And so, you know, sick people generally, really sick people generally don't spread disease because people know that they're sick, right? And so they they either they're staying home or they're at the hospital where there's PPE and there's protective equipment and there's things to 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 stop them stop them from spreading 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 their disease. It, it's people that have very mild symptoms, people that have are asymptomatic, those the, that's the that's the cohort that if if they're even if they're less infectious overall than someone that's very sick there's more of them and they have a bigger window to, to, to spread the disease. And so uh, that, that was really the, the, the problem with, 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 with this coronavirus right now. Was the Cal20C mutation predicted on the basis of energetics? If so, what are the implications regarding development of targeted vaccine or antivirals? So it was, it was, it was not. Uh, this is this. So, so this variant, the, the, the one, the, the, the variants were, were discovered by, by doing actual sequencing, right? And so, so looking, looking at the, at, at the strain, um, uh, at the, at the, at the, the, the RNA code. Um, uh, there, there are definitely multiple studies ongoing though to look at vaccine efficacy. Though we think that it does not, will not have. Um, does the original U.S. strain of the virus still affect other countries? And then at the same time, has the Cal20C mutation been found elsewhere in the U.S. or internationally? So to the second part of that, the first part of that question is that the original strain obviously keeps mutating or you no know, changing mutation is a strong word. It keeps changing as it moves from individuals to individuals. So we don't exactly look like the first place that we looked at in March. Um, and we've been deposited by other, you know, people coming from Europe, kind of influenced the um, population that emerged in New York, travel within states or between states have also moved kind of these clades around or other strains around. Um, 
but Cal 20 C, you know, we discovered it and looked at it. Um, most of our samples were from the cedar samples were the end of December and then looking in the public data. When we first looked, you know, loading the sequence or New Year's Eve, it was, um, you know, just around surrounding states. And there was a couple of cases within uh, Australia and New Zealand. And that would likely dictate travel from LA because we know at that point in time they had very little cases. So it wasn't that New York, New Zealand was bringing something our way. It popped up there likely because somebody from LA went there. But now when we look, it's a different story. It's in much more states and it's in more countries. This questioner asks, whatever happened to contact tracing? It's not mentioned in the media anymore. Contact tracing works great when there's uh, a little bit of virus. When it's when it's when everybody has it, it, it it's impo it's just impossible to do basically. So it works really really well. You quarantine and contact trace, and you get Singapore, which has done a phenomenal job. Or you get South Korea, or you get Japan. Um, uh, but once it's an endemic in in the population, it just makes it really really hard to to do eff uh, effectively. And then this is the sequencing version of that, right? So. The nice part of these this type of work, and when uh, Dr. Bale had talked about how the UK is doing it phenomenally well, is when you sequence, we it's called agnostic. We don't need to know, right? You you you. We don't have to rely on people's memories of where they were. You know, we can say that this moved to uh, to Nevada because there wasn't a case in Nevada prior to us looking at a certain point in time. So we don't actually need somebody's like kind of history of where they went. You know, I, we had showed in our original paper, we could track it down to a postal code. You know, the same eight people shared one base pair difference. And that was early on in May and April. So, you know, using these types of methods, we are, because the numbers are higher, we can't just look at, did you go to Trader Joe's now? We have to look broader and say, who's contributing to whose population globally? within Los Angeles proper, within the state, and across the country. Thank you. Is Cal-20C having the effect of depressing the frequency of observation of the parent virus or viruses? If so, might this accelerate the progress toward herd immunity, or can this be used strategically to further diminish the transmission of the parent virus? So, so you have to remember that this is like what Cal 20 C is, is, is the parent virus just evolved to, 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 a, to a new, a new, so it's, it's still coronavirus. It's still SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so, uh, yes, the proportion of the prior strains is going down because this is encompassing more and more of the, of the amount, but, uh, uh, it's not because this is encompassing more, it doesn't mean that more people will be uh, have herd immunity. Then that's just everyone that's getting infected is kind of adding to that 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 total over time. So that's the you know the, the Sweden strategy, which is like just get everybody infected and then hopefully this will go away. And that that didn't work. So <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah. So so I think I think that that's not the not the best path for for this. Vaccines are really the the way out. Can you provide a reason why we are seeing a drop in infections and in hospitalizations here in LA County? What is the reason? Is there any likelihood that this trend will continue or is it merely a transitory one? I mean, we're hoping that this continues. We do have a glimpse of what the big, when you look at snapshots across um, LA County in terms of the numbers and the spike really coincided to the holidays. Um, and so, hoping um, that people are doing those four things we talk about and that that will contribute. So, you know, the main decisive factor for all of this, take Cal20C out of it. Cal20C is just a reflection of our behavior, right? So if our behavior dictates that we are doing those four things, then it won't be transient. We have the power to make it not transient. Um, and I think that really the social gatherings that likely contributed over the holidays and the end of December when we were overwhelmed, our hospital systems were overwhelmed. Hopefully we've empowered ourselves as a community to take that back, take that power back and not make it transient. Yep. I'm hopeful that there will not be a third wave in, 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 in Los Angeles. And, and I think that there's good evidence to support that. 
Uh, this questioner says, are there long-term unintended consequences of the mRNA vaccine and how does the body get rid of the mRNA? So, so we don't know because a long-term unintended consequence is something that we wouldn't know about beforehand. However, there is no biologically uh, a plausible reason why uh, an mRNA vaccine would uh, be uh, cause some sort of long-term problem down the line. Like I know there's stuff on the internet about infertility and this and that, and uh, that's very, very unlikely um, uh, and not supported by any sort of science uh, to, to say that it would do that. Remember that your body in the air, on your fingers, uh, everywhere around us, there are these enzymes called M uh, RNA aces that literally their only job is to digest RNA. Um, and they are naturally occurring, they're ubiquitous, and actually they, they're a problem for laboratories that use RNA, so like <laughs> us. So, so we know uh, about, the, about the issues, we have to buy special water that's RNA-free water to be, able to, to be able to do this sort of testing. Um, your body has tons of them that are everywhere. One of the reasons they have to put it inside that little oily matrix that uh, that 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 that's used for the injection is so that the it'll be protected before, and then the the macrophages can then gobble it up and eat it so that it's then inside the the macrophage. So uh, it's very unlikely that there will be any sort of weird uh, I am legend sort of uh, event from this from this from this vaccine. Thank you. And on that note, I think it requires. Um, a little bit of thought in terms of the non-scientific community. You know, it hasn't been for most diseases that scientists are at the front of it. So it is not that the FDA approved it in six months. There have been scientists working on mRNA vaccines, which is why Dr. Vail said they're gonna win the Nobel Prize. It isn't something that just happened in six months, that they have worked in mice, et cetera, et cetera. The FDA wouldn't have approved if it wasn't. So. One, yes, we need more studies, of course. It's an emerging pandemic, we, we need more studies. But there isn't to say that there isn't already studies to show that there aren't these like tremendous biological consequences. And theoretically, as Dr. Vail said, it's not, you know, it doesn't seem possible that we can, you know, we need further studies to establish that. Listen, any, any, uh, I anything is possible like I, I don't want to say that because then people will take that into it as, as, as like it's you're saying that, it's that it's going to happen yeah. but but it but it is exceedingly unlikely that 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 this that this that this will have some sort of weird trigger effect down down the line thank you if you have already had both of the vaccine shots what is your risk of cal 20 c infection so nobody knows that we can't speak to that, but we can talk about the effectiveness of those shots overall. And the, the data is about 95% risk reduction for uh, symptomatic disease, and zero of the population in the in both of the clinical trials had severe disease. So that that's that's what we can speak to. Uh, we can't speak to the, the strain itself. Uh, thank you so much. This will be my final question, then I'm going to turn it back over to John. Uh, will COVID be with us for years ahead? I would like to say that I have a true belief in our community right now. I think that, you know, when you um, asked us the question, do we think it was transient? I think let's empower ourselves and say we're already starting the process of making sure that we don't have to deal with this in the future. Um, and keep that trend growing. I know that we're exhausted, but I fundamentally have a belief that we really can do this and, and do those four things we talked about and that that vaccine will help get us there. So again, if you're able and you can, please get vaccinated and then we won't have to hopefully deal with this in the future. What I tell my friends and family is that Thanksgiving of this year will be normal in every way. Um, so, that is that is that that's the that that's the line that I give them. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, but that's I, I really hope and I think that we're going to be able to get through this soon. Well, Dr. Vale, I hope you're right. Dr. Plummer, thank you so much. John, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thanks. Great. And uh, this has been truly eye-opening and informative. And I, you know, think you've given us, you know, a lot more 
hope and enthusiasm. A couple of things stood out. Dr. Vale, you pointing out, please, we're really close. Uh, Dr. Plummer, your line again of we have the ability to curb this virus shows us all what we can do by working together. Um, you two are great. You're rock stars. You've got a real ability to make this confusing science understandable. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. Um, and again, thank you to Kim and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall for organizing this and so many other informative events and keeping everyone up to date on important information. Kim, I turn it back to you. Thank you, John. I want to also thank Dr. Plummer and Dr. Vale for their participation today. We also wish to acknowledge Cedar sinai Medical Center, who is a longtime World Affairs Council Town Hall institutional member for its support of today's live stream. And John, thank you again for moderating today's discussion on COVID-19 variants. It was, as you said, just eye-opening. So thank you all so very much. For our viewers, thank you so much for your support. We hope to resume our in-person events. You heard it from Dr. Vale, you know, even before Thanksgiving. <laughs> My personal, yeah. personal opinion is not the, is not the opinion of, like, what do people put on Twitter? Uh, <laughs> so I'm sorry, that was, couldn't resist, but please um, consider making a donation to cover our uh, operating expenses while we're doing these live streams for free as a public service. We also have some terrific upcoming programs. This Friday, uh, we are doing a program for high school students and teachers on how Gen Z can shape the future of technology. Next week, we have Politics in the Time of Coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. We also have a program on opportunities and challenges in the workforce due to automation. This is one of our young professional programs. And of course, February 19th, Bill Gates and John Ch Don Cheadle the acknowledged award-winning actor and writer's block partner with us on uh, Bill Gates' new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. So please go to our website at lawacth.org, register for our programs, become a member, make a donation. More importantly, stay safe and stay informed. Dr. Vale, Dr. Plummer, John, thank you again so very much.